Hello everyone, I am the Method Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews under the deck text. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on two commanders with partner from Commander Legends, Malcolm Keenite Navigator, and Breach's Brazen Plunderer. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. A more significant way we can help support the channel is my Patreon. For just $1 a month, patrons get early access to scheduled videos on YouTube and higher tier patrons get access to the VIP section of my Discord server as well. You can find a link to both down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Malcolm is a 2-2 Siren Pirate with flying for 2 generic and 1 blue. Thanks to Malcolm, whenever an opponent gets hit by our pirates, we get a treasure token. With the way this ability is worded, we'd have to hit each opponent if we want multiple treasure tokens, and even then it's only one regardless of how many pirates hit. So if you hit three opponents with one pirate each, you get three treasure tokens. If you hit two opponents with three pirates each, you still only get two treasure tokens. Since Malcolm is clearly a pirate lord, he's partnered with the other pirate lord in the set, Breaches. Breaches is a 3-3 goblin pirate with menace for three generic and one red. Breaches' trigger is similar to Malcolm's in that it depends on how many opponents are hit with at least one pirate. When you do, you're impulsive drawing off of that opponent's library. So it's possible to play the top card of each opponent's library. Since it says play, you can also get their lands. So if you have any lands in hand, wait until after you trigger breaches to see if you can play that land with him first. Naturally, I brewed a pirate tribal deck with these partners at the helm. No pun intended. However, there are plenty of other non-pirate creatures in the deck. So before discussing which pirates are included and why, I've included Arcane Adaptation and Xenograft for good measure. That way, all of our creatures are pirates and can reap the benefits for such, especially when triggering either Malcolm and or breaches. Thanks to these enchantments, we don't have to run bad pirates just to fill a quota. We can include the better pirates and great creatures as well. In order to get through and actually trigger our commanders, the deck has plenty of pirates with relevant evasions such as Cloud Pirates, Siren Storm Tamer, and Spectral Sailor. These one-drop flyers are amazing since we can drop them in early and be able to attack with them by the time we have our commanders online. The last two also have an additional ability to make them even better. Don't underestimate evasive weenies when it comes to getting combat damage triggers. Just ask Edric, Spymaster of Trust. Warkite Marauder, a 2-drop flyer, has flying more as a bonus since its other ability is the best part of the card. Being able to turn any creature the defending player controls into a 0-1 with all abilities until end of turn can go a very long way, especially against decks running things like Avacyn, Angel of Hope, and other problematic creatures. Coalition Marauders and Crimson Fleet Commodore don't have evasion but having trample means that they can still get through with combat damage even if it's just one point of damage. The Marauders have the potential of getting even bigger the more turns pass while the Commodore makes us the Monarch when it enters the battlefield, so they're useful besides just swinging in. But better than Trample and Evasion is being literally unblockable. Slippery Scoundrel, Stormfleet Sprinter, and Talos Warrior are three such pirates. You have to have the city's blessing for the Scoundrel to be unblockable, but once you have it, you can't lose it. With these three pirates, you're pretty much guaranteed to get through. Having all three at once is amazing since each can swing in at a different opponent. Daring Saboteur can become unblockable but requires investing 3 mana each time it would attack. That being said, it has a built-in loot effect so it balances out. Departed Deckhand isn't entirely unblockable but can only be blocked by spirits, so it's more than likely going to be able to get through with some combat damage. If that weren't enough, for 4 mana it can also give that conditional unblockability to another creature. Its only drawback is becoming sacrificed when it gets targeted by a spell. Merchant Raiders can also somewhat help our pirates get through by freezing any potential blockers. Being able to tap down creatures whenever it or any pirate enters the battlefield is already a pretty strong ability, especially since those creatures stay tapped down for as long as we control Merchant Raiders. However, even better than this is Xuan Xuan Lord of Wu. While not a pirate, Xuan Xuan gives horsemanship to all of our creatures so he doesn't discriminate by creature types. The deck has plenty of pirates that can take advantage of this quasi-unblockability effect for our commander's triggers. However, all of our creatures having horsemanship means dealing quite a chunk of combat damage with our creatures. Thanks to Arcane Adaptation or Xenograft making all of our creatures pirates, then this goes even further. Kukemsa Pirates being unblockable is just an example. If this pirate attacks and isn't blocked, we can steal an artifact defending player controls. We just have to make it assign no combat damage, which isn't such a bad trade-off if we get to steal any of their artifacts. Now that I'm on the topic of stealing, Dire Fleet Daredevil can steal an instant or sorcery from a graveyard. We do have to pay its casting cost just as with Breaches' impulsive draw effect. But at least the Daredevil is a pirate so it will still benefit from all of the tribal effects in the deck while also benefiting our commanders. Captivating Crew, Coercive Recruiter, and Zara Renegade Recruiter are more theory effects in the deck. As I mentioned earlier, there aren't that many amazing pirates to build an epic pirate tribal deck like you would with elves, goblins, zombies, etc. However, with these we can just steal opponents' creatures. Captivating Crew is a repeatable effect so long as we can pay for it. Coercive Recruiter's effect is also repeatable but it triggers when it or another pirate enters the battlefield. So as long as we can drop a pirate each turn, we can temporarily steal a creature each turn. 
Oh, and it turns him into a pirate too, so it and we get all of the benefits. Zara takes it a step further and steals creatures straight out of their controller's hand. This can be either super epic or total flop. Epic in the sense that you could potentially cheat out a huge creature from their hand early on. A flop because maybe they don't have a good creature or at all. However, an amazing aspect of this ability is that we get any enter the battlefield trigger those creatures have. So there's that as well. In any case, any creatures stolen are also fewer blockers that defending player has, which is another way to help us get pirates through with combat damage. Port Razor is another way to help our pirates get through with combat damage since it can potentially give us three additional combat phases. That means that we can trigger our commanders even more in a turn. Even though we can't attack an opponent with our final combat phase, if we connect at least one pirate with each opponent then we have the potential of triggering our commanders up to 12 times in a single turn, which is ridiculous. Other pirates with an effect similar to our commanders are Corsair Captain, Dockside Extortionist, and Hull Breacher. Corsair Captain creates a treasure token when it enters the battlefield as a bonus, but more importantly it gives all of our pirates plus one plus one. However, possibly the greatest pirates as of the recording of this video are Dockside Extortionist and Hull Breacher. Not only is it cheaper to cast than the Corsair, but it has the potential to create a ton of treasure tokens. With blue-red pirates being a draft theme to this set, I'm incredibly surprised this wasn't reprinted here. That being said, Hull Breacher was, and it's already quite the topic of conversation in the Commander Sphere. Not only do you get to create a ton of treasure with it, but it also prevents opponents from drawing any extra cards they draw. While it's not being used to its maximum potential in this particular deck, it can still be flashed into the battlefield in response to an opponent about to draw a ton of cards. Protean Raider is perhaps the most versatile pirate in the deck since it's a pirate clone. Unfortunately, when it copies a creature, it's no longer a pirate, but that's fine if the clone creature is really good. In any case, it won't matter if we have Arcane Adaptation or Xenograft on the battlefield. The final pirate in the deck is Timestream Navigator. Another way to get the city's blessing, we can take an extra turn when we do. Unfortunately, it's not that simple since we have to bottom deck Timestream Navigator as part of its activation cost. It's still a great trade-off since we are getting an extra turn after all. Being a pirate means that we also get all the benefits from that, those benefits being the rest of the tribal effects in the deck. The deck's running Coat of Arms, Obelisk of Erd, Vanquisher's Banner, and Shared Animosity. Naturally, we won't want to play Coat of Arms against another tribal deck, but if we can take them out first thanks to it, then go for it. The Obelisk has a straightforward pump and is easy to cast thanks to having Convoke. The banner is amazing not only to pump pirates, but it also draws us cards each time we cast a pirate creature. If we have Arcane Adaptation on the battlefield, then it'll trigger off of any creature we cast. Unfortunately, Xenograft can't do that, but at least Arcane Adaptation can. Shared Animosity only gives the pump on attack, but this deck is pretty aggro, so that isn't an issue. Teferi's Veil is another amazing enchantment for an aggro deck like this one since it can protect our attackers from board wipes and sorcery speed removal. Since our attackers phase out after combat, if anyone wipes the board afterwards on their turn, then they'll actually be doing us a favor. Besides the impulsive draw granted by Breaches, the deck also has Grenzo Havoc Razor and Stolen Strategy to stay on theme. Grenzo is similar in that his ability triggers on combat damage. However, Grenzo triggers with not just any creature type, but with every connecting creature. So if we hit an opponent with 5 creatures, we impulsively draw 5 cards from their library. Stolen Strategy triggers during our upkeep, but it does so for each opponent. We can then cast any of those cards until the end of our turn. Fortunately, with the amount of treasure the deck generates, we can very easily cast a bunch of our opponent's spells. Itali Primal Storm takes it a step further by simply casting those spells for free. It doesn't even need to connect with combat damage, it happens on attack. So if we get extra combat phases with Port Razor, we can free cast a ton of cards. With 4 combat phases, that's 16 cards we're free casting our turn thanks to it. It's also 6-6 six, six for 6 mana, which is nothing to scoff at. However, if we just want to draw into our own library, the deck does have its conventional card draw. Kindred Discovery and Distant Melody are synergistic ways to do so given the tribal aspect of the deck. With Kindred Discovery, we are essentially drawing a card each time a pirate enters the battlefield under our control. With Distant Melody, we can draw into a ton of cards for just 4 mana. Further synergizing with the deck, especially the aggressive nature of it, is Coastal Piracy, Biden of Thassa, and Reconnaissance Mission. The last two are just strictly better reprints of the original one, which is pretty flavorful in the deck. However, if we're able to connect with a lot of creatures, we're going to draw a card for each of them. With multiples of these effects on the battlefield, things are going to get pretty crazy. At least we have the option not to draw a card or not. With all three of the battlefield and an unblockable army, we're going to be digging through almost the entirety of our library. Not to mention that Deep Fathom Skulker is also in the deck. So this is essentially a fourth copy of this saboteur effect. However, more than that, it can also be used to make a creature unblockable so it's still on theme with the other effects in the deck as well. It's a bit costly at 6 mana, but at least it's a 4-4 that can help our pirates get through. The deck does have Stroke of Genius as a way to draw a ton of cards at instant speed without relying on any kind of synergy. Sometimes we have to recover after a board wipe and or have an empty hand, we just want to draw into a ton of cards without restriction. Since the deck does generate a ton of mana, it's very possible to sink a ton of it into this and draw an epic amount of cards at the end of the turn before ours. Now, with all the cards we're drawing, the deck is running Thought Vessel and Reliquary Tower to keep our fat hand. 
Thought Vessel is also a very cheap and effective mana rock in a non-green deck like this one. Reliquary Tower is a mana generating land that does not enter the battlefield tapped, so it's not an issue in a two-colored deck. Tapping down for colorless is actually useful for paying for Deep Fathom Skulker's ability as well. Taking further advantage of all the cards we can draw is bringing the pain to our opponents with it. If aggro isn't enough to seal the deal, Psychosis Crawler is one way to either help us get those final points of life to zero or just win us the match outright. Combined with all the card draw effects in the deck, we can have the entire table lose a ton of life very quickly. So it goes in hand in hand with our aggro strategy since our commanders pretty much force us to attack the entire table at once so we're not really focusing on just one opponent. Digging so deep through our deck also helps us get to our responses much more quickly. Pact of Negation, Force of Negation, Force of Will, Fierce Guardianship, Negate, Mana Drain, and Counterspell will not only protect our board state from anything we can counter, but can also be used to stop any combo player from comboing off and winning the game themselves. Since the deck is mostly blue, we have more than enough cards to pitch the Force of Negation and Force of Will. Just keep in mind that Force of Negation cannot be cast for free during our own turn. Cavern of Souls is included to laugh at any counterspell that might be used against our pirates. Thanks to Arcane Adaptation, then all of our creatures are uncounterable. This can go a long way since it helps us cast Dockside Extortionist or Hull Breacher without worrying about them getting countered. Pongify and Rapid Hybridization can help get rid of an annoying and problematic creature. Unfortunately, its controller will get a 3-3 blocker, but with the amount of epic and annoying creatures in the format, them having a Valinal 3-3 will almost always outweigh having whatever it was we got rid of. In any case, Blasphemous Act more often than not will wipe the board of creatures. Obviously, this is going to deal 13 damage to all of our creatures as well, but hopefully they're all phased out by the time we cast it. Either way, it's a great spell to have in case another player has a more aggressive deck or a token horde deck. We don't want to be outraced. In any case, an Overloader Cyclonic Rift will almost always get the job done. Not only can we use it reactively, but proactively as well. If used at the end of the turn before ours, we can clear the board of any potential blockers so we can go crazy with our pirate army. If we want to be a bit more mean, with our removal, Overloading Vandal Blast will get rid of everyone else's artifacts. This can help get rid of stacks or pillow fort effects in an artifact form as well as opponents' mana rocks, really setting them back if they're not green. While Malcolm and other similar effects can get us treasures on the battlefield, we still need to get those effects on the battlefield too. That in green means we're really limited to artifact-based ramp, so the decks running Mana Crypt, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Talisman of Creativity, Izzet Signet, and Phil Warstone. Phil Warstone is included due to all the thievery effects. While our impulsive draw effects allow us to use mana of any color to cast those exiled cards, if any of them have any activated abilities outside of our own colors, we won't be able to play them. These two costed mana rocks are still cheap enough to not slow us down without having to run some of the more expensive zero costed mana rocks, which don't really do much in the deck apart from maybe Mox Opal, Mox Diamond, and Mox Amber. But our commanders are so cheap to cast that we don't have to go so hardcore with free rocks apart from maybe Jeweled Lotus. With Jewel Lotus, we can get out either Malcolm or Breaches on turn 1. The Lotus isn't that bad a draw later on in the game since we do have two commanders. So even if we don't have it as a turn 1 drop, it's not that bad later on as with a lot of other decks. Besides these rocks, the deck can generate a ton of mana with Mana Echoes. If we want to be able to cast as many impulsively drawn cards as possible, getting more pirates onto the battlefield can generate us a ton of mana. Granted, it's all colorless, but our effects allow us to use mana of any color to cast them, so this goes amazing here. The rest of the deck is just the rest of the lands. The deck's running all 8 fetch lands, Volcanic Island, Steam Vents, Trading Center, Sulphur Falls, Command Tower, Shivan Reef, Fiery Islet, City of Brass, Mana Confluence, and Ancient Tomb, as well as 10 snow-covered islands and 5 snow-covered mountains in case anyone's running anything that benefits us for it. The deck is a bit more than twice as blue as red, so that's why the basics are in that ratio. As with all of my deck techs, almost the entirety of the budget is in the mana base. So if you don't have the more expensive fetch lands, Volcanic Island, Mana Crypt, or Jeweled Lotus, then budget substitutes aren't just fine and the deck will still run well enough without them. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Malcolm and Breaches. Granted, this isn't the only way to build a pirate tribal deck, but I like this one more than Admiral Beckett Brass, even if I do miss out on black. Malcolm and Breaches give you mana acceleration as well as card advantage, which is something crucial to have in the command zone. If you're interested in the decklist of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I'm the Method Kirby, and happy brewing!